of the uh, this evening's show. Uh, my name, as you might expect, is Dan Crean. Um, I practice law um, primarily out of my office in Pembroke. Um, been around for a while, as you can tell by the color of my hair. And um, this presentation is going to be quite a bit different from Bernie's. Uh, Bernie's was hard law, statutory law, case law, and pointing to things that somebody else said. This is primarily going to be what I hope will be practical guidance to you. Um, I have entitled the presentation Land Use Board Decisions. Uh, take the word decisions in a very broad sense because I want to talk not about making a single decision on an application, but about the process of making decisions because it really is a process. And I'm going to start with some concepts and lead you through some um, other um, aspects of the process as we go through it. If you look at the, the materials that I've provided the paper, part one deals with uh, using and handling applications. To me, I've been at this for a while. I've been on several boards, um, uh, planning boards. I've not been on a zoning board because if I was ever on a zoning board, people would hate me. <laughs> um, um, but I think that the application, which is really a tool, is greatly underutilized in the process, and I'll talk about why I think that's the case. Um, part two is about making and recording decisions. Making decisions can be hard or easy. We all like to try and make it easy. That can lead to some of the things that Bernie just talked about which means a court case. My comments on making and, and, and enforcing decisions and writing the notice of decision are intended to try to keep you out of court or try to make your chances of winning in court a little bit better. Um, I've also included materials on the special concept of a land use board record. I don't think I'll get to that, but I um, and I think I'm not going to cover all the materials anyhow in the time that we have, but I hope you take that back. I've included two appendices or exhibits. The first is a sample developer improvement agreement. You don't need a developer improvement agreement in every case. I think that it is a tool that can be very effective if you have performance surety, whether it's a performance bond, a letter of credit, or something else. If I was a lawyer doing that, I would call it malpractice. I think it's malpractice of a board, a land use board, to have surety without a land use developer improvement agreement. If you look at what a surety does, performance bond or letter of credit, what it simply says is we are providing security, that is money, force the performance of an agreement. If you don't have a developer's agreement, you don't know when it's breached. And when can you draw on that surety? So use it. Um, and I'm going to be talking about what are called exactions or conditions on approval. And the last part is an adaptation of a checklist for use of exactions that was put together by the Utah League of Cities, uh, cities and towns, and I adapted it for use in New Hampshire. So with that um, description, what I hope to do, now we'll start. I have to start, I am a lawyer. I'm not here as your lawyer tonight. I will try to answer questions you have, but understand your attendance tonight does not make me your lawyer. <laughs> so what are we trying to do? Um, I want to provide general guidance on how to make and record decisions so that you can avoid uncertainty. What was it that somebody said? Bernie mentioned a case where we had to go back and look at minutes 
to try and figure out what was intended. That's not a good practice. Do you know what the minutes say? I mean, we all read minutes, but do you really know what they say? And are they accurate? So you want to know what was decided, and in some cases, why was the decision reached? The purpose is to assist in administration and enforcement. Administration means making sure that you know what is required of the applicant as we go along. Enforcement simply means being able to enforce the decision. And lastly, to provide a defense if the decision is challenged. When I first started at this, land use board decisions got challenged, not very frequently, and usually the result was pretty good in court. We had a, ju a judiciary, including the Supreme and su Superior Courts, that didn't really necessarily bend over backwards for um, cities and towns, but they were pretty lenient. As long as you made a good faith effort, you stood a good chance. That changed in the 80s to almost strict compliance. If you made any kind of mistake, you had problems. Today it's even out a little bit. And thank goodness today there is finally a member of the New Hampshire Supreme Court who has some local government experience. <laughs> okay, so decisions. What are we talking about? Why not just make a decision? Isn't that the easy way to do it? Get an application for variance? Yes or no? That's quick, but it's dirty. <laughs> In some cases, the law, as Bernie talked about, requires you to do more. For example, if you deny an application, you have to state why. That's a concept that we lawyers call fairness and due process. If you deny somebody, you ought to say why. If you're granting a variance, and you're on a zoning board, you also have to state why. You have to state why the application meets the criteria for variance. Even beyond that, what the law says, though, I think it's worthwhile giving some reasons why you are making your decision. For a couple of reasons. First, it may help you make the right decision if you think about it. And secondly, it may help you if the case gets to court. Judges will ask and often ask, why? Why was something done? And if it's in the record, it's a lot easier to point to. Third thing, third reason, is if your decision is well written and it points out why you did something, and you have an attorney who's guiding a butters or opponents or the applicant, and the attorney's trying to advise that person whether to go to court or not, and if he looks at that decision and says, that's a good decision, you may not even end up in court. So I hope that you look at this not as an exercise in making work for yourselves, but in trying to short circuit the process uh, to avoid ending up in court, which nobody wants to do, really. Okay, that all sounds good. What's so difficult and problematic about practice as usual? Um, I've given municipal law lectures that, that Mike mentioned for a long time, and I remember giving one in Bow, uh, when they used to have them in Bow, it is only uh, Lakes Region where they've stopped giving the lectures. And I would always bring in a point about the right to know law. And back in the good old days, the right to know law said you could have deliberations in private. We called them executive sessions back then, not non-public sessions. And you could actually deliberate. And zoning boards in particular back then thought it was a good idea to deliberate in private. So they would hear the testimony and then everybody out. Leave the room, we're gonna talk. And so they would talk, bring people back in. Who knows whether they voted in public or not, or I mean in private or not, about what the decision was going to be, but they would announce their decision. 
And I criticized that, saying I think it was not a good practice, even though it was permissible under the law. And there was a gentleman in the back of the room who, when I said this about for about the third or fourth time and over the course of the years, I could see he was getting agitated. Didn't like it, because that's what he did. And I said at one point, you know what you're giving the impression to is that something is going on that you don't want the public to know about. And what you are doing when you're acting as a land use board is nothing other than the public's business. And so why in the world wouldn't you want to do it in public? And it has the added benefit of letting people know that this is not an easy job that you're doing. You have competing interests, you need to discuss them and you need to consider them. And it lets people see how you try to arrive at a decision. Well, that struck the chord with the gentleman in the back of the room. And he stood up, indignantly said, you mean they get to know how we think? And I said, of course, because you're doing the public's business. And the public has a right to know how the public's business is being conducted. So this notion of decisions is a process, and it's a process that requires debate and discussion and consideration. So we all use transparency in government today, and I think that's way overused term, but there is some appropriate way that transparency enters into the land use process. Speak very just briefly about all the different things that limit land use control on the local level. First, there's property law concepts. Bernie's discussion about entry onto private property brings to bear this notion of what is property. Property isn't just the ground, or it isn't just a house. What gives property value is the right to use it, or the right to exclude others from it, or the right to sell it. We call this a bundle of rights that is associated with property. And that leads to limitations on local government powers that interfere improperly with some of those exercises of rights. Okay? When we talk about the Nolan and Dolan cases later on, we're talking about one of the most important rights, and that's the right to exclude people from your property. So you can't, at least under normal conditions, say that you're going to give us property or you're going to give us the right, the public, the right to access your property as a condition of subdivision approval or site plan review or a variance unless there's justification for it. So you need to know why you're doing what you're doing. Um, Bernie talked about the First Amendment cases. So there's all sorts of SOBs or sexually oriented businesses. Um, we don't have many of those cases in New Hampshire, but they're still all over the country. Um, signed cases, that's an exercise of free speech. Uh, religion, um, you may have heard a term called ARLUPA, which is the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act, which the federal government um, Congress has said you need to be very careful about what you're doing with regard to certain religious uses in your land use controls. Um, Fifth Amendment is takings and exactions, 14th Amendment is due process, equal protection, and then we have enabling legislation and preemption and Bernie gave you a really good example of the telecommunications uh, limitations. Um, the FCC in Washington, under what Congress did in the Telecommunications Act, um, is constantly looking at trying to facilitate deployment of telecommunications. We don't know what's going to happen with cable television, broadband, all the mergers that are going on. This industry is going to be completely different five years from now. And what 
and, and the FCC and Congress are going to try and implement that, so we don't know what we're going to be able to do at that point. Recurring themes. Um, local versus state and federal preemption. Who pays for development? That's really why we're here tonight when we're talking about exactions. Exactions are requirements that a developer do something or not do something. Are we talking about preserving property values, dim diminishing them or enhancing them? We're also talking about what kind of growth is going to occur, how fast will it come, and how do we control it? There's a famous quote that if a policeman must know the Constitution, why not a planner? So, land use board procedures. Statutory requirements. The one primary thing to keep in mind is that we are, as New Hampshire said, in New, as Bernie said, in New Hampshire, and we have to abide by what the legislature says. Sometimes it's stupid, sometimes it's contradictory, but it's the legislature, and we have to do what they say. Uh, you all, as a member of a land use board, need to have rules of procedure. They can be called bylaws, they can be called procedures, they can be called policies. But every land use board, by law, has to have rules of procedure. And you should follow them. They shouldn't be kept in a back drawer somewhere. Call, hauled out only if somebody is questioning what's happened. You should make sure you follow the rules on a regular basis. Keeping up to date, Bernie did a great job of updating us on what's been happening the last few years in both the legislature and naturally the, the Municipal Association and other in the Regional Planning Commissions also do a great job of trying to keep us up to date. One of the real difficulties in New Hampshire is that the legislature passes laws they usually have an effective date where the law takes effect 60 days after passage. The statutory changes that are compiled in the supplements to the RSAs don't come out every 60 days. They come out several months after the legislative session is over. So we need something to look at to try and keep up with what the changes are. If you go to the legislative website on NewHampshire.gov, go to the legislative um, homepage, and there is under their uh, general list, there's a thing called chaptered session laws. And those are what the laws write, what are the, the laws that are passed by the legislature as the session is going along. As soon as they're signed into law, or shortly after that, you can actually go and read what the law says. I look at that during the session at least weekly because I don't, otherwise I could be advising my clients on something that is odd, the way the law has changed. Um, and, and a lot of the laws, in fact, take effect earlier than 60 days. Some take effect later, but you don't know. Um, notices. I'm going to t talk a little bit about notices because that's an important part of the process. Conduct of the hearing, I probably won't talk much about that given the time, but it's in my, in my materials, there's a uh, discussion on it. Uh, deliberations, and then just the basic concept of fairness, due process, conflicts of interest, bias, and prejudice, and I'll have a couple of re remarks on that. Rock TV.